This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As the United States, Britain and other nations begin unprecedented mass vaccination campaigns to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, other parts of the world may not have access to vaccines for months, if not years. A new report finds as many as nine out of ten people in dozens of poorer countries could miss out on the coronavirus vaccine until at least 2022, because wealthy countries, including the United States, are hoarding enough doses to vaccinate their entire populations between three and five times over. The report was issued by the people People's Vaccine Alliance, which includes Amnesty International, Frontline AIDS, Global Justice Now and Oxfam. This is Winifred Bayanima, executive director of UN AIDS, in a video produced by the People's Vaccine Alliance. Huge pharmaceutical companies are keeping the vaccine research a secret. They're deciding how many vaccines get made, how much to charge for them, and who gets vaccinated. This will no doubt leave billions of people behind. Pharma companies are putting profit, not people, first. Yet, billions of dollars of taxpayers' money is funding their work. We cannot let the CEOs of a handful of pharmaceutical companies decide our future. We need a vaccine that everyone can have free of charge, no matter where you live or whether you're rich or you're poor. We need companies to share all their research so we can make enough safe vaccines for everyone. We need a vaccine owned by all of us. To end this COVID-19 pandemic, we need to pull together once more. That was the UN AIDS executive director, part of the People's Vaccine Alliance. The World Health Organization has also warned about the inequitable distribution of the vaccine. This is WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. We simply cannot accept a world in which the poor and marginalized are trampled by the rich and powerful in the stampede for vaccines. This is a global crisis, and the solutions must be shared equitably as global public goods, not as private commodities that widen inequalities. In early December, Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez and I spoke to two guests about the calls for a people's vaccine. Dr. Moga Kamal Yane joined us from Oxford, England. She's policy advisor to the People's Vaccine Alliance. She worked for decades on access to medicines and healthcare in developing countries. And Achil Prabla joined us from Bangalore, India, where he's coordinator of the Access IPSA project, which campaigns for access to medicines in in IBSA, that's India, Brazil, and South Africa. He recently co authored an op ed published in the New York Times headlined Want Vaccines Fast? Suspend Intellectual Property Rights. I asked Dr. Moga Kamelyane to talk about the call for a people's vaccine. Well, the People's Vaccine is a coalition of um, organizations like uh, Amnesty, Frontline AIDS, Global Justice, Oxfam. It's co-led uh, by Oxfam and, and UNAIDS, and it, it, it has so many people, um, um, you know, academics, health activists, health experts, NGOs, um, uh, uh, patient groups from all over the world, united for one aim, which has a people's vaccine, not a profit vaccine. So we want a vaccine. Basically, we're calling for vaccination that, uh, you know, that is available for all people at risk and then for everybody once we have enough doses. But not the way it's happening now, where if you happen to be born in a rich country, you get the vaccine. If you happen to be born in, in a poor country, you don't. And I mean, yesterday in, in the UK, they started vaccinating um, 
uh, older people and there was some clapping and, and, you know, it was a lot of joy. And of course, that's brilliant, you know, that there is hope that this this problem that we're all suffering from will will be, um, you know, like there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. However, that joy is only limited to people living here. I've got friends and, and relatives and people that I work with in other countries, in developing countries, who are saying, yeah, and what about us? And yeah, what about them? So this this is really a big problem. There's just so many. It's kind of dividing the world between those who have and can pay and who, those who don't and can't pay. And therefore, well, you can stand in the back of the queue. We don't know when you can get the vaccine. And that is just not right. It's not right on moral grounds. It's not right on public health grounds because everybody's saying nobody's safe until everybody's safe. Yeah, OK. How do you make everybody safe? So a vaccine nationalism will not get you to everybody safe. And also on economic ground, is not you're not going to get the economy growing if just one or back to normal, if one country vaccinates its population and the rest of the world isn't. You can't um, trade with people who are sick or pe- or people who have a you know high high level of infection. So what you know it's just, it just doesn't make sense at all. The other important point is that this is not kind of fact of life that, oh, we have limited amount of vaccines. Actually, that's not, that's not the case. There are other options that will uh, enable the world to produce more vaccines and therefore vaccinate more people. So basically what's happening now, if you can imagine that we have a small pie, so that's one vaccine, a small pie. And so basically the rich can have the bigger share of it. And then we'll have just crumbs left for developing countries. While the idea is well, that, well, why don't we increase the pie so everybody can have a decent share of it rather than fighting on a, uh, for, on a little, uh, little one? Well, Dr. Kamaljani, I wanted to ask you about the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine and how access to that vaccine may be more equitable uh, uh, at this stage. Could you talk about some of the agreements that the uh, AstraZeneca has reached with the Coalition for uh, uh, Epidemic Preparedness Innovations and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance? Well, basically, I mean, this vaccine has been developed by Oxford University. Oxford University had a standard on managing uh, intellectual property, and it actually talks about open license. However, when they did the, the, the deal or the contract with AstraZeneca, it became exclusive license for AstraZeneca. But they managed to put some conditions in the contract about making the vaccine accessible to developing countries. So AstraZeneca went to one of the big vaccine producers in India, um, uh, the Serum Institute, and uh, made an agreement to produce one billion doses. So that's vaccinating 500 million people. Half of them will be in India. So um, it's a good, propo- good, uh, good way, you know, good start to make more vaccines available. They also, AstraZeneca also has some agreements with other countries, like with Argentina and Brazil. So that uh, may cover um, a number of people in in Latin America. But what about the rest of the population? There's some other deals with countries, but not production uh, as such. You know, you can't leave, it, you know, so AstraZeneca compared to others, yes, they do, they've done um, uh, good things and also fixing the price as, um, uh, well, four do- AstraZeneca said $4 per dose and Serum said $3 per dose. So for developing countries, it will be probably $3 for, for per dose, so six per course or per person. Um, But the thing is, you can't leave, this is the whole thing, you can't leave the decision on supply, price, uh, which country, which patient, to companies. That's not their job. Their job is to produce. And the job of, of, of governments is to make more production. So you have to um, enable other producers, like in India, there's other producers, other countries would have other producers. So if you allow technology transfer, so sharing technology, which the technology, by the way, 
a lot of it has been developed by public money, including from the US and the UK and Europe and uh, other countries. So allowing the sharing of technology and removing the intellectual property ba barrier, so no patents on, on vaccines, then other companies can produce the vaccine and we have more. And just like AstraZeneca did this uh, contract with Serum that includes presumably technology transfer or some technology transfer, um, that can be done on a multilateral level, on a bigger level for more companies. Because all these, these deals, by the way, they're all secret. You don't know what's in it except what they announce. Rather than if you have a, a multilateral agreement, you don't you know, the, the negotiation happens in, in, in closed door, but then once they agree a license, then it's public. Then you see what's good and what's bad about it. I wanted to bring Acho Pravila into the conversation, again, coordinator of Access IBSA project, which campaigns to access um, medicines for India, Brazil, South Africa. This piece you recently wrote in The New York Times, Want Vaccines Fast? Suspend Intellectual property rights. You're joining us from Bangalore, India. Can you talk about what that would mean if you suspended intellectual property rights? Talk about trade secrets. Talk about patents. Talk about government subsidies of these private companies. And how does what's happening now, the development of this vaccine, compare to people's access, for example, to the flu vaccine, how that was developed and financed? Thank you, Amy. Firstly, it's, it's great to be here, and, and thank you for having me. Um, uh, the piece that we wrote in The New York Times uh, was geared around an event that's unfolding this week and the next. Uh, it doesn't look like it'll get resolved um, anytime soon or successfully, but that event is a proposal that uh, South Africa and India made at the WTO, at the World Trade Organization, to uh, temporarily suspend uh, a trade rule called TRIPS, which is an agreement on trade-related aspects of intellectual property, the super governance uh, of intellectual property worldwide, which the WTO uh, takes on. And the reason India and South Africa suggested that uh, all member countries of the WTO should be exempted uh, from provisions of TRIPS is so that Everything that we require to survive the pandemic, the masks, the test kits, but now especially the vaccines, should be free to be made in as much capacity as possible to get them faster and cheaper to as many people as we can around the world. Uh, the, there is an overwhelming support from developing countries for this proposal, but the WTO works on consensus, which means that even if uh, five or six uh, very rich countries oppose the proposal, it actually won't pass. And that's exactly what's happening. Uh, the US, the EU, the UK, and a few other rich countries, as well as inexplicably Brazil, have opposed this proposal and are stalling it, which means that it's unlikely to go through without a fight. Now, uh, the, the irony of the fight having uh, to take place this week is there's really good news out of the UK. There's also really good news out of science. And uh, personally, for me, sitting in India, uh, I wish I could share in that good news with the same spirit of cheer and celebration. I saw a moving interview with a 91-year-old called Martin Kenyon uh, in London, who called his hospital, said, hey, I heard you had vaccines. They said, yes, come on over and get one. He walked over and he got a Pfizer vaccine, the first dose of a Pfizer vaccine, and he's looking forward to hugging his grandchildren this Christmas, and it's a beautiful, touching story. The problem with that is that Pfizer vaccine, over 90% of its supplies until the end of 2021, so that means for the next 13 months, have been sold out to a handful of rich countries, to the US, to the EU, and to the UK. Uh, there's actually no way that anyone in India or anyone anywhere outside these rich countries is going to get their hands on one of these vaccines for love or for money. They just don't exist outside a very few number of rich countries. Uh, that's kind of amazing to live through in 2020. I've been campaigning for access to medicines for a long time, but uh, my father had uh, COVID. Uh, he's 87 years old. My mother is 72 years old. I definitely would like them to have a vaccine and get one fairly quickly. 
the prospect of these vaccines being unrolled without any possibility of a majority of the world getting them is genuinely heartbreaking. Uh, and that's the, the anger that partly prompted that piece. Um, the irony, of course, is that this is such a dramatically different situation from the 1950s when the flu vaccine was developed by Jonas Salk, who, of course, famously said, uh, when asked by Ed Morrow um, about whether he was going to patent uh, his invention, uh, he said, ha, 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 uh, can you patent the sun? And uh, it's a heartbreak. It's a beautiful, <laughs> it's a beautiful moment. It's a really beautiful moment. And, um, and that was about they, the they, polio vaccine. I'm sorry, that was about the polio vaccine. That's exactly right. And, and that, uh, that's about the polio vaccine. The tradition of Jonas Salk, however, does continue with the flu vaccine that we all take. That flu vaccine is developed at a unit of the WHO, uh, uh, which is called informally the flu network and formally the Global Influenza Surveillance and Research uh, Systems. Uh, it's a co collaborative uh, infrastructure that they've set up at the WHO that involves uh, 110 different countries, 130 different laboratories, which pool information on what strains of influenza are circulating in their countries. That information is collated, and every year for two different flu seasons in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, the WHO then releases uh, what would be called the formula for the flu vaccine, which then anyone anywhere can produce because it's completely free of any proprietary intellectual property or monopoly, which means that billions of people have taken it since the 1970s based on this cooperative shared uh, system of n pooling knowledge as well as finances. And that's created a very robust infrastructure for the production and consumption of these flu vaccines. And it's a great success. It's unfortunately exactly the kind of thing that's not being replicated with the coronavirus vaccines. Well, Achal Prabhal, I wanted to ask you, in terms of the refusal of these handful of rich countries uh, to allow the suspension of intellectual property rights at the, the WTO, what is their argument, given the enormous uh, uh, worldwide crisis that we're functioning? How do they defend this, and what could possibly be done to overcome this resistance? I wish, actually, sometimes that people would just be honest and upfront and say, look, we actually care about these corporations more than uh, global human life. We're actually fine with a certain number of uh, usually poor people dying for a lack of access to these vaccines, as long as the companies and the industry that makes them survives. Uh, there's an, I'd be willing to listen to that argument because it at least would be honest. Uh, what, what happens instead is that the uh, arguments that are advanced are, A, that it's not a problem. To say that it's not a problem ignores 20 years of human history where millions of people died because of lack of access to monopoly drugs for AIDS, and then did so again for lack of access to drugs for cancer, and then did so again for lack of access to hepatitis C drugs, and by the way, are doing today in the United States for lack of access to insulin, which is again patented. Uh, for a lack of access to PrEP, for AIDS, or for a lack of access to cystic fibrosis drugs in the UK. So it's to deny reality. But the logic that's advanced is that the innovation system requires these monopolies to exist in order to reward uh, private pharmaceutical corporations for taking big risks with private money. Except for the fact that that's not what's happening here. It's never happened, but it's never happened as starkly as it is uh, not happening in the in the pandemic. Uh, Moderna, which is just one of the vaccines that uh, posted successful results a couple of weeks ago, has admitted by its own, in its own financial reports, that 100% of its vaccine development project was funded by BADA, by Warp Speed and the US government, US taxpayer money. Uh, on top of that, it's been given pre-orders uh, of another one and a half billion from the United States, and another substantial amount of money nearing about a billion from the European Union. Um, every other vaccine, from Pfizer to AstraZeneca, also has substantial government money. German taxpayer money of up to $445 million went into the Pfizer vaccine. 
Um, AstraZeneca received huge subsidies through uh, public money from the U United Kingdom through uh, its early development at Oxford University. All of these vaccines have, on top of that, received these very lucrative, very large pre-orders. Now, you can't have it always. You cannot have uh, a vaccine project literally contracted out. I hesitate to say subsidy because when it's 100 percent of the cost, that's not a subsidy, that's ownership. Um, you cannot have a prize like a pre-order of uh, $6 billion, which is basically what Pfizer has awaiting it uh, on successful completion of its trials and approval. Uh, and on top of that, say, but we also need the intellectual property monopoly because of all this private capital we've risked, which doesn't seem to actually exist. It, it is very, very strange, but this is the argument that's being advanced. It doesn't hold water. Um, I think they understand that as well. It's just that this argument has a rich history. Uh, it's embedded in a particular kind of thinking, a, a particular a branch of economics, which they know that they can ride on uh, and, in effect, lie their way through uh, opposing what is really a very sensible and unradical proposal made by South Africa and India at the WTO. I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Kamal uh, Yani again about the, uh, the, the situation with uh, the, the Trump administration had removed the United States from the World, World Health Organization. Uh, President-elect Biden is now saying he will return. Uh, the U.S. to the WHO. What do you think is has been the impact of the United States pulling out of the WHO in the midst of this pandemic? Well, I mean, what do you say about such an amazing, really, you know, in incredible, irresponsible, I'm afraid, um, decision uh, in the middle of a pandemic to do that? I mean, it's it's strange decision, even if we're not in pandemic. So what do you think if we are in the middle of it? It's really, really uh, not very good. My, my dream, to be honest, as a non-American uh, about your election is, is to, to retain two things. One, the American role in 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 um you know in advancing global health and particularly in joining the who and and also uh, you know putting science before politics this this has been also very very problematic from from the us it really affected uh, not just decision makers in other countries but also ordinary people this ignoring the science behind covid um, was really really bad so we do hope that the new administration i mean they made commitment biden made a commitment to join the who that is fantastic the sooner the better you know um, that would be great. But also for the U.S. to join something like or to, to voice public support for something like this um, technology access pool that WHO and other countries uh, co-sponsored to do the facilitation of um, licensing intellectual property and so managing intellectual property that, you know, your previous question, but also um, uh, facilitating technology transfer. To, to, to other companies. So sub, it's supporting the CTAB would be absolutely fantastic. Finally, how exactly, summing up in a minute, um, yeah. if you uh, got around trade secrets, if the companies were forced to release their trade secrets, um, they didn't get patents on this, how would a people's vaccine work? Every company all over could just develop the vaccine where it is. What's shocking, President Trump signed some executive order, not clear how enforceable it is, called America First. We have learned, if you're altruistic or not, if someone is sick somewhere in the world, you are in danger. Um, so this is, everyone is in this together. But what would a people's vaccine, how would it happen? What it requires is, firstly, for companies to say there are two aspects of our monopoly that we'll give up. We'll share with you our patents and we'll share with you our trade secrets. Trades, trade secrets are the know-how and the technology that's required to make a vaccine. It's, it's a very important part of the process. If they were to say, look, we'll license this to any company with a reputation and a, a, a quality certification that's willing to make this vaccine with us, then uh, let's open it up and let's have anyone interested uh, do it. 
And if they did that, they would suddenly find that there are whole avenues of supply that open up around the world. There are over 20 vaccine manufacturers in India, but there are also eight vaccine manufacturers on the continent of Africa. And there are a number of ways in which you can do this collaboratively. The one way not to do it is the way that they are, by producing these artificially limited quantities of these vaccines by sort of keeping it all to themselves.